Ooh, baby, you're listening to the Powell Movement. Welcome to another episode of the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and this week we're going to talk to a guy who seems to have more wins in ski slope style than almost anyone, but being from the Midwest, he has a different outlook on the sport and the lifestyle, and he really doesn't fit in. My guest is Nick Gepper, and he's the 2014 Olympic bronze medalist, and his path to professional skiing has an Axel Rose quality to it. It starts in Indiana, and he moves out west where he achieves his goals in a way that's so hyper-competitive that it rubs some people the wrong way. And that's where the Axel Rose comparison ends. Before we get into the podcast with Nick Gepper, I want to ask you to subscribe to me on Instagram at The Powell Movement, share my posts on social media, and reach out to me with any feedback or concerns that you might have. My email is mike at thepowellmovement.com. Finally, I need to thank my sponsors. They are Evo. Rescue Water, Ten Barrel Brewery, The Summit at Snoqualmie, and Unofficial Networks. Please support them and use the codes offered in the ads, because when you do, it makes them happy with me. Now, let's talk to Nick Gepper. Nick, how's it going, man? It's going good. Where am I talking to you from? I am at the Utah Olympic Park in Park City. They got a pretty sweet jump up here. It's like a jump with like a rope toe right next to it so you can get a million laps on it. So it's pretty awesome. Nice. It's like the hill growing up where you skied. Really small and tight. Yeah, exactly. I Honestly, the elevation is probably about the same, maybe a touch smaller, but yeah, it's about it. What's that facility like? It should be state-of-the-art, the best in the world for athletes, I would think, right? Because you're the Olympians and you should have the best. And is the facility like that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's pretty sick. It's kind of different strokes for different folks. I mean, it it is really nice and it's private and it's a well built jump. But you know, some people would rather ride a public park with multiple jumps and rails and a bunch of people around. I guess what I was thinking when I was talking about state of the art facility is when you think about NFL, because I'm thinking about the best athletes in the world. Yeah. On paper, you are one of the best athletes in the world on skis, and. The care that you see those NFL kind of players get, where there's doctors, ice tubs, all kinds of different things. You would think there's massage on staff at all times. Do you guys have that as athletes in Utah? The U.S. team is great for that. I mean, as as a member of the A team, like here today, there was two physical therapists just on site. And then, of course, like down the street is the uh, center of excellence, the USSA facility that's state-of-the-art has everything under the sun from ice baths to massage and physios and and all that stuff it's great because you can take advantage of it if you want to a lot of people don't a lot of people actually don't like the uh the coe and and all the -the state-of-the-art facilities they'd rather sort of do their own thing but i'm kind of half and half i really really love it but i also need some time to sort of do my own thing do you get free food there nice yeah. healthy food at all times for you because i would just live there if it's free food and drink that's probably one of the best parts about it honestly is there's a cook on staff usually every day more so in the summertime but there's like delicious food all the time and i wouldn't exactly call it free because you had to work super hard to get on the u.s team and, and grind and, and pay all the money and all that stuff when you were younger but it is a nice bonus <laughs> what are you talking about it was easy you had this ability you went to a contest you won it they put you on the team and now you're eating for free forever we had christmas last week and i believe you're one of the christmas people what's christmas like at the geppers oh man christmas at the geppers is great it's awesome i mean i grew up pretty middle class so our christmases were never extravagant no gifts really over 50 dollars and Great time with the family. That's what I love. I got two sisters in Utah now, and I got my little brother back at home still. He's uh, almost 16, and of course, the family got to congregate back in southeastern Indiana, and it was awesome. I got to take a few laps at my home mountain, Perfect North Slopes, about 10 minutes away, and it was great. Honestly, I kind of was really lazy. I just slept in a bunch, ate a bunch of sweets and Christmas type food and and sort of had to like get back on my game after uh, I left home after five days. I was feeling a little groggy. 
So you actually you think about that when you were at home and you weren't really working out and training, that's going to affect you next week. You actually notice that? Shit, I, I stayed up like till two in the morning one night playing video games with my brother, got like four hours of sleep before going to the airport the next morning and I just kind of let myself go. But I think I needed it. I think I need, needed to just spend that carefree time with my family and, and then just sort of get back into the swing of things after the holidays. When I was your age, I let myself go for about 15 years, <laughs> just trying to, to pick all the pieces up now. But for you, life starts in Indiana, and it's weird for a professional skier to say they were from Indiana. I guess the weirdest story would be maybe Seth Morrison being from Kentucky, I believe. No way. Yeah, I think he was born in Kentucky, and then I want to say he moved to maybe Minneapolis or something. I could be totally wrong. That's so sick. Yeah, working his way out west. So yeah, you're from the middle of the country, Nowheresburg, Lawrenceburg, Indiana. <laughs> and uh, what's Lawrenceburg near? So Lawrenceburg is right nestled in the Ohio River Valley. Damn, that was sick. Right next to Cincinnati, about 20 or 25 minutes away from Cincinnati, Ohio. So I'm just sitting here, like looking out the window, watching other kids hit the jump right now. So that's why I said, damn, that was sick. But anyways... When I describe like where I'm from, I claim Cincinnati, Ohio, because that's the biggest metropolitan area that people are familiar with. Then I say like, oh, yeah, well, I'm actually from the, the tri-state area between Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky right there in southeastern Indiana. So everyone's like, oh, are you a Colts fan? I'm like, no, I'm for the Cincinnati Bengals, Cincinnati Reds, because Lawrenceburg is basically like the little town, a little suburb of Cincinnati, actually only an hour and a half from Indianapolis. But it's a great place to grow up. Definitely a humble place to grow up. I'd say a pretty normal Midwest style childhood. If Cincinnati's an armpit, it's kind of a pimple underneath the armpit is Lawrenceburg and you put cinnamon in your chili. I suppose, you know, like chili is a huge Cincinnati thing. It's really like Cincinnati chili is like what Cincinnati is known for that and Grater's ice cream and then La Rosa's pizza, a bunch of just like Cincinnati things that people wouldn't really uh, ever hear about. I mean, I feel like Cincinnati used to be a bit of a an armpit, but actually it's gotten really nice over the last like 10, 15 years. I've read tons of articles about the up and coming Cincinnati skyline and how it's changing the world of technology. I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> I didn't really spend much time down in Cincinnati as a kid, but just going back as an adolescent and as an adult, it's cool to go actually check out the city and go to some of the more young, like social parts of town. Uh, this one part called Over the Rhine. It used to be a pretty dangerous spot, but it, they've sort of made it a lot nicer. And so it's fun. It's nice. And you have two sisters and a brother. Yeah, I got two younger sisters and a younger brother. I'm the I'm the oldest. Are you protective of your little sisters? Have you ever had to stand in the way of any guys being assholes to them? No, not assholes, but like I'm definitely really protective. That's funny you say that because like my littlest sister, Brady, she's just 18 and she's been dating this guy for like a year or two. And it's funny. It's funny. Like I really like him and he's an awesome dude, but it's funny putting on a front like the intimidating big brother front and being like, don't you mess with my sister, you know, kind of like that. So. Sports-wise, it seemed like it was skiing, soccer, and swimming. Those are kind of the main ones, but skiing was, was never a primary focus until I was like 14 or 15. I was pretty well-rounded thanks to my parents just helping me get involved in a bunch of youth sports. I played a lot of soccer growing up. I, I swam a lot. Played a bunch of seasons of baseball, played a couple of years of football. And then, of course, like I had an action sports side to me, too. So I loved riding my BMX bike and building trails and I loved uh, skateboarding, but like my main thing was rollerblading. I was really into rollerblading, and my neighbors helped me get into that. I was reading something that a couple of your friends had said from growing up, and they said that if you weren't a pro skier, you would have been a pro soccer player, or you would have been an Olympic swimmer. Were you really good at whatever you set your mind to? I think so, but I think at first I was like, okay, soccer. I really like soccer, but it's sort of like that love sort of faded, and and I was still trying to push myself and, and develop my skills, and it just stopped happening later in my soccer. Like rollerblading, for instance. I really, really loved rollerblading, and I think just because of that love of doing it, it just helped me to push me and, and get better. And I th I'd say that was the one that I developed the most skill at. How old were you when you started blading? Nine or ten or something. 
did you get a pair of like aggressive skates right away or was it just a pair of uh, regular rollerblades and then eventually you saw people jumping and got a pair of aggressive skates? My neighbors growing up, this neighbor kid named Andy Yingling, he was about three or four years older than me and his dad, uh, he was a single child. They lived right next door and I'd say if it weren't for them, I wouldn't really be into action sports now. I wouldn't be a pro skier because I was playing soccer and I was swimming and, and they were like kind of a more eccentric family and for the Midwest at least and I went over one day and they were like rollerblading and I was like, what the heck is this? And Chris Yingling, Andy's dad, gave me a, my first pair of rollerblades. I think it was like an old shitty pair of K2s or something. And, and they were just really into it. So I just all of a sudden got really into it. And then I just started to love it more and get more like competitive, like with Andy, but also with myself and want to like do more tricks. And I was like, well, shit, these rollerblades like can't keep up. Because, like, the sole plates on them weren't big enough to grab onto, like, big coping or ledges. And so I was like, damn, I need to get some new rollerblades so I can start doing better tricks. And what year are we talking about here? It's, like, 2005? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Blading has just gotten out of the X Games. Kids your age are still doing it because they saw it in the X Games, although that's dead for the skate world. Yeah. Are you into the, the skate scene? Because there's a lot of message boards and websites that are focused on rollerblading. And if you're a rollerblader, that's the only place to get your media. And were you involved in that back then, too? No, I was totally unaware of the skate scene. I mean, I skated with the neighbor kid and then the kid up the street. I'd go to the skate park in town, the local skate park in Lawrenceburg, and I'd be the only rollerblader. And it was like this really weird dynamic because i loved it so much and i was so into it but oftentimes i was the only one doing it but i mean i just pushed myself and had solo sessions a lot but you know it's funny you say that because i wasn't aware of the scene really but like there was one time when i went to cincinnati with my dad and my friend and we watched this like event series kind of like the due tour it was called mss oh i was there <laughs> mobile skate park series and i watched the Yasutoko brothers crush it on the vert ramp when I was like, I don't know, 10 or 11 or something. I remember watching them on the vert ramp. And then I think maybe that year, the next year was the last year they were in X Games, watched them like dominate on TV. And I was like, holy shit, that's badass. And oh my God, holy, Troy just did a dub 14. I loved it. But the only problem was I was the only one that did it around. So it was kind of hard to go to the skate park and be solo, but whatever. When you pick a sport like rollerblading, which is an outcast sport, you might not have known you were picking a sport like that, but you're immediately going to get shit a bunch of places that you go and people that think you're not cool immediately because of what are exactly. in your feet. And did you experience that? Yeah, I did. And and sometimes I go to the skate park and there'd be other guys, maybe like one or two other guys and that were blading and I'd be like, holy shit, like those guys are like gods because they're like, we're better than me. And I was so stoked that there were other people there doing it. But I think it just kind of hardened me a little bit and just made me a little bit tougher. And because I didn't really shy down from it. I was like, fuck it. If I'm gonna, I love it so much. I'm just gonna go, you know, have a session and I don't care. But I think it definitely taught me a little bit of independence and taught me how to sort of pave my own path per se. Okay, before we get into paving more of your path, I'm going to jump into my sponsors. And my first sponsor is Evo. And if you haven't been to their retail locations in Denver, Seattle, or Portland, you are missing one of the greatest shopping experiences in the country. They have the best brands, employees who are approachable and knowledgeable about the products they sell, cool art, and a service shop that'll have your ski, board, or bike dialed the first time. And oh yeah, they were started by pro skier Bryce Phillips as a website, evo.com, which everyone knows is a site to go to for the best online shopping experience. Not only does Evo offer a low price guarantee, free shipping on orders over $50, and a no-hassle return policy, for listening to the show, they're going to give you 10% off your entire order. When you check out of Evo.com, use the code capital TPM, the number 10 at checkout, and you'll get 10% off your order. My next sponsor is Rescue Water, and they are Proactive Recovery. If you don't know what that means, I want you to try something for me. Next time you hit the mountain, the gym, skate park, or practice, skip the sports drink and drink a cold rescue water. There's no gimmicks here. It's science and it works. And you'll notice how much more hydrated and better you feel compared to your normal post-exercise drink of choice. The game changer for me is that it works great after a big night. Trust me, drink one rescue water before bed and you're going to be good in the morning. We're going to make it easier than ever for you to try Rescue Water. Head on over to rescuewater.com, order a 12-pack, 
enter the code RESCUEWATERTPM, that's R-E-S-Q Water TPM, all one word, and get a 20% discount on a 12-pack. Rescue Water is also available on Amazon and Amazon Prime. So those are my sponsors, and now we can get back into your life. You eventually get out of rollerblading at some point, and I hear you're an amazing skateboarder as well. So how did you end up getting on a skateboard? I sort of did both. I, I was I was like 75, 25 growing up. I skated a bit too because, I mean, I was just more social and because there were more people that did it. But I would say right around 15, 16, 17, I started traveling with skiing a lot more and it just became like more convenient to grab a skateboard and, and just kind of roll with that everywhere I went. And also too, the thing was, I got back into blading a couple of years ago and it was just like too much like skiing. And when I'm not skiing, like I don't want to mimic skiing because then I'll just get like competitive with myself and like pissed off and be like, oh, well, that's going to like, if I do like a bad Royale, that's going to reflect on my skiing or something. So I don't know, just weird mind games I play with myself. I like skateboarding because it's, it's totally different from skiing. A lot of similar muscle groups and like pumping tranny and, and finding lines and stuff, but, uh, but the tricks and sort of the flow is, is different. So you also surf a lot of here. Not a lot, but when I, when I'm near a coast, I try and get on a board as much as possible. And I hear you're good on a surfboard as well. It sounds like you're one of those kids that's naturally talented at many different things. Growing up, you also had a trampoline set up in your backyard. That was kind of crazy. It wasn't my trampoline in the backyard because. My parents were not about to drop like $1,500 on the trampoline. And my, my neighbor actually, not the neighbor kid who got me in the rollerblading, but the other neighbor next door, they had a trampoline in the back that they used like once a year. So we just went over there and we would like poach it. Like we weren't really supposed to be jumping on it because the family wasn't that stoked on it. But we would just go over there anyways and bounce on it all the time and practice like cork sevens and cork nines and stuff. And then eventually... When I was like 14, I convinced my mom to let me uh, pick out a trampoline on eBay and set it up in the backyard. And then we finally got the trampoline and it was like a rectangle one, but it had a black bed. And uh, I remember like finally jumping on it and being like so disappointed because it wasn't as bouncy as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Did the neighbor have the white bedded super bounce trampoline? No, no. They just had a normal like circle tramp, but it was still a black bed and it was I don't know. My friends, we'd like double bounce each other. That's how we would go big. And and I was like, all right, sweet. Well, I'm going to make a step up from this and get the rectangle bed because if it's a rectangle, that just means it's twice as bouncy. You know, that's kind of my logic. I had no knew nothing about the material of the bed or the springs or whatever. And then we eventually got it and it was like subpar. And I was like, well, whatever. I'm just going to make the best out of what I got. And so I just like was hucking big tricks on this tiny little trampoline and we can talk about getting into skiing, but I'm going to guess that your resort was perfect north and it was 20 minutes from your house. You probably went up there as much as you possibly could and it was a babysitter. And I'm guessing there might have been a rope toe that you ruined millions of pairs of gloves on to hit a jump. And eventually you started getting really, really fucking good at skiing. Just off topic, this is cool to get back in all these like memories and talk about them. I haven't really thought about these in a while. So Perfect North was great. It's a, uh, it's like a small family owned resort. They don't even serve alcohol there. Boo. <laughs> the owner, Clyde Perfect, he never drank and he was never into it. So they, they still don't serve alcohol there in like 30 years of operation. But the, the way it started was back in like the eighties or something, there was like this local college kid who was doing like an engineering project. Did he drink? I don't know. I hope he did. I, I don't know. But he like mapped out this hill sort of on the side of Route 1 right next to Lawrenceburg. It's sort of in this like 300 vertical foot valley. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to put a ski resort on that hill. And it's going to work because of this, this, and this. And then he like submitted the project. And then somehow Clyde Perfect found out about it. And then just like ran with the idea and turned this hill into a ski resort. There was a really healthy park scene and particularly skiing park scene. I mean, I, I just felt like really, really lucky because that's sort of what influenced me to get into skiing. There was this crew there called Freezing Point 32. That was what they called themselves. And they had this big, huge like tour bus that they went to like local big airs in. And they were like gods. I was like, holy shit, those guys are so awesome. And uh, you might know a couple of them, Tad Feiss and uh, Rich Fahey. 
couple of guys and and they were sort of like amateurs like didn't quite break through to go to the pro ranks but the park was right out in front of the lodge and it was lift service but there was like another mini park with a rope toe that I definitely ruined a lot of gloves on but I just started to like hitting rails and jumps and and just got like a million laps on it because there's never you can like literally ski right onto the lift and not have to worry about lift lines or anything and it was just great and are you going every day after school not every day but like probably three or four nights a week always going on the weekends and trying to balance that because i was still swimming and like playing like a little bit of indoor soccer but like my passion was slowly starting to shift towards skiing and and so I slowly got like less and less passionate about soccer. And I remember the last couple of years of soccer, it was like a chore to go to a game or go to practice or something. I remember my coach is telling me like, yo, man, where's that fire we used to see? And I was just kind of reflecting on myself and being like, man, I think I think I'm just too obsessed with skiing to like soccer anymore. At this point in life, your dad loses his job and that impacts the whole family. I don't know if your mom's working as well, but is that a, a significant moment in your childhood that makes you become an adult really quick? Yeah, a little bit. I was like 14, 15, right around 2008, 2009 when the recession sort of really hit. And I remember m my dad being unemployed and my mom went back to work. She bought a franchise called Liberty Tax Service and started to run that. And I didn't really realize the scope of it at the time, but all of a sudden, like, my parents weren't able to take me to the ski slope after school anymore because my mom was working and my dad was out, like, job searching or whatever. And so I, my parents had less flexibility and became way busier, but also my, my sisters were heavily involved in gymnastics at the time. So I, I had to, like, kind of rely on myself to call literally every one of my contacts and find a ride to the slopes every day and I did become a little bit more independent because that's when my parents became a little bit more cautious with spending. And so it really uh, influenced me to go out and make my own money and do odd jobs and, and really sort of hustle to try and just like afford new stuff. When you say hustle, because I mean, having to do that at a young age, I feel like that makes you grow up really quick because you realize I want to go ski or I want to pass. I've got to earn this money to do that. What kind of jobs are you doing to make money? And I mean, how much do you have to work? Do you actually feel like you have to provide for yourself? Not like food and, and just basic stuff, but things I wanted. Yeah, like if I wanted a new pair of blades or a new pair of goggles or a new pair of pants or something, my mom used to be able to, a little more flexible and be able to buy me stuff. But I was like, shit, I got to make my own money now. So I, 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 I got like one regular job when I was like 14 at this like bar and grill down the street from my house called Willie's and I was like a dish boy and I just cleaned like disgusting dishes and, and like bagged like raw meat that would turn into chicken nuggets and it was <laughs> awful and I like scooped out potatoes for like twice baked potatoes and th that was not fun at all and I was like and my boss was kind of an asshole <laughs> I was like I do not want to do this anymore I was a babysitter like I got really into babysitting and had like a few families that I babysat for. My dad actually was like pretty supportive of my entrepreneurial efforts. And he actually like had this sign made that said, dependable babysitting, call Nick and with like a phone number on it and like literally put it in our front yard by the road. <laughs> I was like so embarrassed. Like it was so bad. But like I knew what was best for me and I knew that I would get more business if this like stupid sign was in the front yard that embarrassed the hell out of me. So like the rational part of me was like, all right, I got to leave the sign. I can't take it down. And then I went like door to door and, and uh, just I had this little like resume bio sheet of paper that I typed up with like my skiing aspirations and my goals and like where I want to be. And, and then I would like give it to people and be like, hey, do you have any odd jobs around the house or something you'd be willing to hire me for? So I ended up staining a guy's deck one summer and like pulling weeds for this other lady and mowing this couple's yard uh, every week. And I actually did get quite a few jobs and it made a little bit of money. So it was a, it was a good experience. But did you feel like it was something you had to do? Did your friends have to do these type of things? Or did you feel like, oh, I've got to do this or I can't do what I want to do later on? Was it a burden for you? It wasn't a burden, and my friends weren't 
really doing that type of stuff. But like at first, I, I had no idea what I was capable of. Once I started to get jobs and develop relationships with like different, we'll call them clients, it was fun for me. I mean, like the deck staining job was miserable. It was so boring. But like, just like the the pursuit of of getting more jobs and sort of like building up experience um, was actually really fun. And, and yeah, I was productive. And so I was like fulfilled and, and I had a bonus because I got money from it. So thinking back to those days, who was that hot mom that you were always so psyched to do jobs for? Uh, oh, so there was this, uh, there was these two girls growing up. Their names were, they were in my class, Angelina and Josie La Rosa. And they're like family started La Rosa's Pizza. The deck that I was staining for this guy, he was like their uncle or something. So like oftentimes Angelina or Josie would like stop by the house to come and visit with their family. And I would get to see him and I'd be like, oh man, I had a huge crush. It wasn't really on the parents, but it was on like, the kids that were like affiliated with the parents so all right mama la rosa (laughs) yeah skiing takes over in your life and becomes your passion and what's driving you and in the winter time did you guys get snow at the house no maybe we'll get one call it like storm that will maybe drop like four inches uh, maybe once or twice a winter and then it's gone in, in 24 to 48 hours because of the crazy temperatures. But no, it didn't really snow at the house. I mean, when it did, we'd go sledding when I was younger. But when I got a little bit older, you know, it set up a rail in the backyard and hit it on my skis or something. Any epic backyard jib setups when you're growing up? That's kind of where I was going. For the summertime, yeah. I didn't really know about like summer setups until I saw a bunch of videos on new schoolers and and did a bunch of online like research. And so I sort of figured out that you could do that. And I, my dad helped me build a rail one summer and then we got some AstroTurf and built like a little kicker jump and my, my backyard has a little slope in it. So it was sort of a natural drop in where I could get speed. And I, I sessioned this rail quite a bit. And then the next summer I like, invited my friend over and my dad didn't help at all and we built like this really sick like 22 foot rail that was sort of like a down up with a little donkey at the end not only was it super fun to like ski on and no one else would ski it with me i didn't really have any friends that skied at my level so like i would invite my friends over to film me but i would session the rail but more so than being a fun rail uh, i was so stoked on the fact that like i built it with no help from my dad and and it was like a really solid rail. So, I know you end up going to Windell's Academy. So Windell's is the summer camp at Hood. And they eventually come in and put like a school there, right? They're like, hey, we're going to yeah. bring in some teachers and we're going to have kids. Were you part of the first class at Windell's? Second class. So Windell's Academy started the year before I was introduced. And this was right about age 15. I was a sophomore in a public high school. What kind of kid are you in high school? <laughs> oh, dude, I'm like probably a weirdo. Not a weirdo, not like a like a nerd, like a geek, but just in, just into like different stuff. I was honestly really socially awkward and like really socially anxious and just had like a phobia. Like I never, I was terrified of school dances. I was terrified of going to uh, football games and like standing in like the student section. I was honestly going and hanging out at a social like school function was more terrifying than like trying a, my first double cork or something. But like I've I've kind of always rolled this way just throughout life. But I had like my one or two like really really good friends, and I'd spend most of my time with them because I was really obsessed with obviously like skiing and like rollerblading and like no one in holy shit that was sick. Nobody in southeastern Indiana is into that. I mean, that is such an anomaly, such like an unusual thing for a kid to be into. But I just happened to be into it because Perfect North Slopes and and then my neighbor and everything. So, I mean, usually the norm was like football, basketball, just more kind of traditional sports. Yeah. And you're not the team sports kid, it sounds like, after you get to be about 10, 12 years old. Yeah. There's not many kids that are pro skiers that win any kind of medal that come out of Indiana. It's just how it is. If you're a skier and you're born in Indiana, you were born to be a marginal, at best, maybe a a flowed product skier. But you kind of broke that whole mold by doing what you've done is prove that, hey, 
I can ski on man-made snow my entire life up to 15 <laughs> and I can become badass and it doesn't matter where you're from, especially in slope style because the features can be built on a trash mound and we can ski yep. on them and you were able to prove that. One big factor of my success as a kid at Perfect North was there was one other kid who was really fucking good who really, really pushed me and, and I was really competitive with. And you've probably heard the name, but Chris Laker. Oh, yeah. He was from there. That's funny. People don't really know that. But Chris and I, like, we weren't really close friends growing up. He was always like a notch better than me. I mean, if I was doing switch sevens, he was doing switch nines. If I was doing K feds, he was doing super feds. If I was going to a big air in Ohio, he was going to a slope style contest in Park City. It always seemed like he was just one notch better than me. And I was like so, so driven. And like he pushed me so much when, when I was a kid. And so, I mean, I don't think he knows this, but I, I mean, I owe a lot. He was a huge influence on me growing up and, and helped me to really like aim for something. But that really influenced me a lot. And we both have sort of done our own things in our respective careers, which is really cool, especially coming from the same spot. Did you like him back then or did he just fuel you like, God, that motherfucker's better than <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like I said, we were cordial with each other. But like, I honestly think the competitiveness got in the way of me wanting to be like really tight with Chris. But you know, that's just the way it goes. You know, that's just personality types and whatever. That's part of your MO, though. Being super focused and competitive is just who you've always been, right? It's not like anything new. Yeah. You had it with Chris when you were younger, and he might not have known it, and you've got it today, but there's a reason that you do well, and that's probably part of it. Yeah, yeah. But really, to progress to the next level, you do need to move somewhere out west or somewhere, you know, whether it's out west or, you know, New England, to where there's skiers that are going to push you. There's coaches that can help you get better and you can experience the lifestyle of skiing a little bit more because when you're coming from Perfect North, you're getting a ton of laps and I wouldn't say it's the scene that you get when you get to Hood and you're engulfed in it. At age 15, I remember specifically one night, my, mo my mom would usually like come in and sort of like rub my back before I went to bed. <laughs> oh, how sweet. Yeah. And uh, thanks, mom. Love you. And then... I remember one evening laying on my bed, I was in tears. I mean, a 15 year old teenage adolescent, I was like crying because I didn't know if my dream was going to be able to work out because I knew that the prospect of being a pro skier in Indiana was impossible. Like I was not going to make a career in Indiana unless I could afford to travel, which I couldn't because of our family's financial situation. And then there were no events, there was no scene. So I wasn't able to do it. So I was like, I've got to make something happen. We've got to do something. And I remember just being like, almost a little bit hopeless and like, just fucking crying because I was so passionate. I wanted a glimmer of light. I like wanted to make it happen so badly. And what I did is I got on the internet and I started researching like different contests and, and things. And I, I came across ski academies. And it wasn't even my parents who found out about ski academies. I think it was me. And I was like, yo, mom and dad, check this out. Like there's these ski academies that you can go to school out east or out west. The ones I was looking at were like Okemo Mountain School, Waterville Valley Academy, Carabasset Valley Academy. And I was like, yo, these are so sweet. You can go skiing and do your high school and they travel and go to contests and stuff. And I was like, yo, check these out. And of course, my parents got online and checked it out and made some calls and, you know, figured out it was like... 20, 30 G's for one year of high school. And, and they're like, yeah, Nick, there's no way in hell it's going to happen. But bless my mom. She recognized like my passion and, and she never said no to anything. And so they got really interested in trying to get a scholarship from one of these schools to maybe go like half tuition or like three fourths tuition free or something like that. And so they were in the middle of doing that. And, and I actually went to a trial week at a Carabasset Valley Academy in like April one year. And I think the same summer, that summer, I went out to Vermont. We, we like doubled it as a family vacation, but also went out to check out Okemo Mountain School. That fall, when it got down to brass tacks, we we're like, we can't afford this, Nick. We can't do this. And so then through a network of people we'd been talking to, we were looking for 
financial support from uh, maybe like a, a wealthy sponsor that would be able to help me. And by sponsor, I mean like an individual. A rich person that believes in you. Exactly, exactly. And we came in contact from Mike Hanley, who was my coach for five years, but he was the president and the half founder. It was him and Tim Wendell. He was starting Wendell's Academy. And my family got in contact with them. And the prospect of a scholarship was possible with Wendell's Academy. So my parents sent a couple of my like season edits to Mike and Wendell's. And they were in a position where they had the summer camp. So but they were looking to get some talent to sort of get the ski program off the ground at Wendell's. And so this incredible opportunity came up to go to Wendell's Academy tuition free, like 100% scholarship. And I remember like getting that news and just like I was 15 and I literally just started crying. I was like, holy shit, I'm going to be able to chase my dream basically. That's a huge misconception, I feel like, with my story and my career is there's a lot of internet forums and shit on the internet that just like people think that my parents foot the bill for 80K to go to ski school for like three years and I didn't pay a dime to go to Wendell's Academy. And I got to just give a huge shout out to Tim Wendell and, and Mike Hanley and, and all the folks at Wendell's for making that happen and just... I feel like Wendell is a sort of family and, and I always make it back there and I always try and make a point to just stop in and just give back. So I've talked to a few people about this and I'll talk to you about it as well. So Mike is your coach for five years. He really develops you into the skier that you are today. I would think he's a, a huge part of that. Yeah. There's another guy in your life and he's been in a lot of skiers lives, Kerry Miller. Yep. And he's an enigma in skiing, I would say. He's the old guy that takes boys to live and travel with and hopefully turn them into champions. And like on paper, if I were 15 and I was telling my mom, hey, no, this 65 year old guy or we don't really know his age, he is going to take me and he's going to we're going to stay all these different places. I would think my parents would think that was strange. And I don't know if there was any strangeness with your family in dealing with that. But talk about Carrie Miller. What's that whole situation like? Yeah, sure. Sure. I don't know if you noticed, but I conveniently left that part of the story out. <laughs> but no, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. When my parents and I, when, when we were looking for basically like rich guys who believed in me to, to help support me to go to a ski academy, through a network of people, we came across Carrie Miller. And Carrie Miller, like you said, was this enigma in skiing. He's still a mystery to me, like sort of a retired or semi-retired or something, but just just was really passionate about developing young talent in this industry and really has a great heart and just believes in, in kids and their abilities to go for their dreams, which is awesome. He was the connection that pointed us in the direction of Wendell's Academy. And so, of course, when I left for Wendell's Academy to go to Oregon, he came out to Wendell's Academy and, and became an employee of Wendell's, became a, a residential advisor. He basically acted as my manager for about four or five years, not only helping with travel, but also he helped acquire a couple sponsors for me, which was great. It was an unusual relationship because I I'd, I'd never paid him anything. There were never any contracts or anything like really professional. Um, it was like, this person was doing this out of the good of his heart for a noble reason. I know that there's a, a lot of misconceptions about Kerry Miller and his presence in the ski industry. Of course, he had a pretty uh, tight relationship with Jossie Wells, Tanner Hall, Mike Wilson, a lot of big name pros and, and has had a majority positive impact on a lot of people. And so he was a huge part of my life for like three or four years between like 16 and, and like 19. When was the last time you communicated with him? Uh, shit, like three years ago, I think over three years ago. Unfortunately, it became me trying to grow to be my own adult and, and sort of this weird relationship that's not professional was sort of continuing. And unfortunately, we had a, a falling out when I was about 19, actually right after the Olympics in Sochi. And it was right then I had gotten like a real agent and had sort of started to develop like the Nick Gepper brand a bit more. And, and we just had a falling out. 
for just some silly reasons, but for Kerry's sake, he's a great person, great heart. You know, he, he's done a lot of great things. But we just had to split up. It, it Basically, it was like a bad breakup with a girlfriend that you've been dating for a while. For whatever reason, you got to break up with this chick. But like you've had so many good times and like you know that she's a great girl and blah, blah, blah. But it just doesn't work. Well, the big difference is you bang your girlfriend and you hope that that doesn't happen in any other situation. <laughs> yeah. You set me up for that one. For sure. That, I saw that coming. <laughs> One thing I will say is you haven't had communication with them in three years. I wonder about all those other names that you said if they communicate with them. But we don't need to worry about that. One thing I do need to worry about is another sponsor break. And I love saying this. I have a beer sponsor, and it's the Ten Barrel Brewery. They brew beer, they drink beer, and they have fun doing it, period. They're located in Bend, Oregon. And if they had a company mantra, it would be get after it on powder days and drink beer outside. The people behind the beer are what you would expect from Ben folk, outdoors-minded people who believe in the products they make, love the place they live and play, and they don't take things too seriously unless it makes a difference. The current difference maker is Jeremy Jones's Protect Our Winners. Right now, they are donating 1% of sales of their current seasonal Pray for Snow Ale and their trail beer to the Protect Our Winners Foundation. You can learn more about Protect Our Winners at protectourwinners.org or just buy more beer and support the cause with your drinking. Check out Ten Barrel online at tenbarrel.com or get the full Ten Barrel experience at one of their pubs in Bend, Portland, Boise, Denver, and San Diego. My final sponsor is the Summit at Snoqualmie. They've been my go-to ski destination in Washington since I've lived here. Why? Because it's 45 minutes from Seattle, which makes powder weekday mornings a reality. You can shred the Summit and be back at your desk by noon. They have great terrain for all ability levels, and you don't need to ski or snowboard. They have world-class tubing that's fun for the whole family. When you're planning your ski time this winter, spend your hours on the mountain, not in your car. Getting a pass at the summit at Snoqualmie just got more affordable. For listening to the Powell Movement, you're going to get pre-season pricing on your season's pass. How? Head over to summitatsnoqualmie.com, find the pass that works for you, enter the code POWELL18 at checkout, and I'll see you at Seattle's favorite place to ski. That wraps up sponsors. Now we're going to get back into it. At this point in life, I mean, you've spent time getting 200 days a season sometimes on snow. Are you skiing pow at all? Or are you just focused on your craft of slope style? <laughs> I'm focused on my craft of slope style. And that's funny you bring that up. I remember like my first ever couple powder days at Mount Hood. And of course, Timberline on Mount Hood isn't really the steepest ski resort so actually meadows was a little bit better but like i remember skiing pow and it was like so weird and it was so awkward and i just had a hard time figuring it out but i mean i don't know honestly up even up until now like i was always so focused and like so like just passionate about my craft and that was all i wanted to do like that was all i wanted to learn a new trick i wanted to like learn a new axis or something i was always like working towards a new benchmark, I guess. What was the the one trick where you think back and you're like, I learned this and that opened up a whole new set of everything for me. Is that your first dub? Yeah, that, that's a great point. I'd done the two or three years at Wendell's Academy. I think I was 17 and that was right around the time I had learned a few doubles. And that was right when like unnatural spinning like became way more important in skiing contests. I remember doing like my first unnatural double and that was when some of the older guys were like first starting to experiment with those and but they sort of became big and on the on the slope style scene i was like sort of really early on that train and and started doing some on that dubs and and just linking like because you never heard of someone doing two or even three doubles in a run and i was like one of the first guys to start doing that and that really was a huge thing in in my early contest career that sort of catapulted me to the top was just I wasn't scared to try on natural doubles or link two or three doubles in a row. I mean that was I think what helped my early success. We're not gonna go through all the early contests, but we'll fast forward to your first X games. It's two thousand twelve. You're eighteen years old. Yeah. Well actually my first X games was two thousand eleven. I did Euro X in uh teen. Your first Aspen X games two thousand twelve and is this the first time you're really starstruck at a contest? Yeah, I first got invited as an alternate, and then I think I got in, or maybe I just got a regular invite, but 
thinking back, you know, I wouldn't say I was really starstruck. I was so like in the zone, like trying to do my own tricks and focusing on my run and everything that I don't think I got really starstruck by the guys that were around me because I had already done a couple contests with like Bobby and Tom and Sammy, like the Dew Tour and the Dumont Cup and some of those. And so I'd seen some of the similar guys, but the fact that I was at X Games in Aspen, which was the Super Bowl for me, was pretty eye opening and amazing. And that year we did slope style at night under the lights, which was so sick. And there were four jumps, which uh, is unusual, but it allows you to spin all four ways. And I think that played to my advantage, but there wasn't any pressure. But part of that was because I was just like a newbie and I had nothing to lose. And I didn't really have a care in the world except for landing like my switched up 12 and like left up 12 right before that. (laughs) And you fit in like when you're in the athlete lounge. Are you friends with any of these guys? Or are you kind of in your own zone, in your own world? You said you used to have one or two tight friends. Everybody else is whatever. Is that how it is at the X Games and at these contests too? For sure. Is it you in your own zone? For sure. Absolutely. Especially my my first few successes. I mean, Dutor, the Dumont Cup, X Games. I was rolling with like the Wendell's Academy crew. And those were my friends and like my people. And then all of a sudden I was going and like winning or getting top threes in these events with sort of these more veteran competitors. And I don't think I was understood by a lot of the guys. And in just being like really shy and sort of an introverted person to begin with really accentuated that. And I don't know what it was like for Tom and and some of those older guys when I would come in and like beat them and get second or third or win. But I imagine that it was really frustrating and I can understand because I'm kind of in that position now where there's like these 16, 17 year olds that are like really fucking good. And it's kind of making me a little nervous for a few years. I wasn't really part of the big pros and like the crew. I mean, I didn't really party that much. Didn't really like socialize too much except with like my own crew. And yeah, I just don't think I was too well understood. Coming from Indiana with a mountain that doesn't serve booze, (laughs) <laughs> the ski lifestyle of get off the hill, go apre for a bit, maybe get some dinner and then go out. That's probably not part of your nature. It's like, hey, we're done on the hill. We're going home. Exactly. You just you you literally hit the nail right on the head. And I never even thought about it like that, like coming from perfect north where they don't serve booze. There's no bar or anything. The party scene and, and the apre scene was totally foreign to me. And even my family growing up, like, you know, my dad like would have, you know, one or two beers a week, never a drinker. Mom barely drank. So it was definitely like a little more conservative. Your first X Games, you get second. That's got to be a dream come true. You're on the podium at the X Games. And then they have the 10% rule. And I don't know if they, they look at you like, hey, little kid, yeah, you won this amount of money and you're going to throw down. I don't know how that works. But do you find out about the 10% rule the, the minute you get second? And not really. I mean, I was 17 and I wasn't really tight with a lot of the guys. And so like, I don't even think that was really a factor. But I do remember one time I was at this big air contest in Sweden. And like Gus Kenworthy and Bobby Brown were there. And I remember Gus coming up to me, the contest was called King of Style. And it was like my first ever stadium big air contest. And I was so mad. I did a shitty trick and didn't qualify for finals. But I remember like the night of finals I watched and then we're going back to the hotel and Gus like invites me out to go to the bars and, you know, with the guys. And I was like, I told him no, because I just, I had this like, I wouldn't say like fear, but I I guess, I don't know, this like fear of like compromising myself and like my value system or I don't know what you want to call it, but it was like the hardest no I've ever said, you know, to like a, like a peer pressure situation. I was like, no, I'm not going to go. And and it was really fucking weird. And I remember that same night, I like went to the gym and went to like, got on a spin bike and just like, rode this fucking bike like hell for like an hour to make up for not going out with the guys. I was like, fuck, well, I'm not if I'm not going to go party, I'm going to go like, make myself better in some way. So I'm going to go like, make my legs stronger. <laughs> I guess it's not a weird thought process. To me, it is because I don't ever think about making myself better. I always go to the bar. But (laughs) yeah, it's uh, it's interesting that you decided that I'm going to stay in and make myself better and these guys can go make themselves worse, even though you you didn't say that I did. (laughs) Sounds like 
I, I don't want to say you don't fit in, but it sounds like you don't fit in too well. Yep, you're when right. When it comes to after hour situations. And does that bother you at all? Does, do you want to be liked by people or do you not even care? I didn't really care, but secretly I did. And, and let's see, I was 20, 21, and I first started to drink a little bit and got drunk the first time. I was like, actually, I was 18 or 19 out at Wendell's. Yeah, one summer at Wendell's and fuck, like, like me and a, a lot, a bunch of all the coaches and like some of the guest pros like went out on a surfing trip to the coast and we had this huge like camping set up in the woods and we made this huge fire and I remember I got so, so wasted that for some reason, like I guess someone had been there before us and had been like fishing mm-hmm. and they had like filleted these fish and threw all the fish carcasses like out into the weeds next to the campfire and I was like stumbling around and like fell in this like fucking pile of fish carcasses. And then the whole rest of the summer, like the next five weeks I was there, like all the coaches, everyone called me fish guts. Huh. And, <laughs> and did that curb your drinking right there? No. Well, it definitely like taught me to be a little bit more moderate, but that was like my nickname the rest of the summer. And I was like real embarrassed, but there was a phase where I started to experiment more with like going out and partying and, and because I had been so like abstinent for a long time I think I uh like overindulged a little bit too much and you know hadn't had that experience like kind of pacing myself and it burnt me out pretty quick but definitely became a little bit more like open to to socializing and and just being you know in difficult situations that I was like uncomfortable in and stuff like that. Would you have rather have just stayed home or are you looking at drinking as a way to be accepted by your peers and, and just a way to be more social? A little bit of it was being accepted, but the majority of it was like, I got to try this and see if it's fun and see if I like it. You know, to see if it like fits with like my personality. I just wanted to like experience it for myself. But then I realized, you know, it's like getting real drunk and, and partying hard wasn't really my thing. And so I started to moderate a lot more and it didn't become a priority. I think you can still make it a priority every night if you drink a rescue water after you're done because it really works. I just wanted to throw that in there. But moving on your career, you just started crushing it. I mean, these contests all probably become a blur, but there's a lot of podiums for you. You have X Games gold in 2014, 2015, not so well in 16, 17. But you go on a tear of contests, and when we talk about the Olympics, because that's the next big one on your radar, I'm not going to talk about qualifying because I think you had an easy time qualifying. It wasn't easy, but your hard work and preparation made it so you didn't get a discretionary selection. You were selected right away. Exactly. You went into the Olympics with a broken hand, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that summer, the summer before the Olympics, I did like a switch five on a jump in New Zealand and like overshot it, went off to the side and just like hit my hand on some ice and broke it pretty badly. Had to go back to the States, get surgery, got a couple pins and like a screw in there. And then the first event of the Olympic qualifying was the Dew Tour. And I ended up skiing super well the Dew Tour and won it, but I was skiing without poles because I like my hand wasn't strong enough yet. Like I couldn't like hold a pole and like grab like successfully. So I just skied the event without poles and ended up winning. And I was like, fuck yeah, this is sick. And actually after the Dew Tour, I had been skiing for like two or three months without poles and it was, I was like really used to it. And so I could have started using poles after do, but I was like, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That was kind of my methodology. And so I skied like the next few events, including the Olympics without poles. And I was like, fuck it, this is working. And you know, I'm having fun still. Of course, like the ski community got all offended and butthurt. And you know, I got all these comments on social media and all this like stupid little comments just from people and online and shit. And I was like, you know, I just stuck to my own thing. and was like, I don't care about like being cool or whatever. I just, I'm doing what works for me and you know, I'm having fun and I'm still doing good. So. But you had to know some of that was coming. I mean, when you look back to Nimbus independent back in the day, Andy Pep and Pollard went a little while without polls and it was heavily debated throughout the ski industry. Eventually, those guys put poles back in their hands, which I think you have done as well. But when you are going to step into a sector of skiing slope style, which a lot of the cool kids are playing in, yep. 
that just gives someone some other piece of ammo to just point a finger at you and be like, look at that guy, man. He's not skiing with poles and we're going to hate on him. Yeah, exactly. And of course, like aerialists don't ski with poles. And so, you know, I got a lot of hate about being in like, oh, Gepper looks like an aerialist, blah, blah, blah. And honestly, like it did get to me, but I was just like, I didn't really care enough. You know, Louis Vito, another awesome guy from the Midwest is from Ohio. I'm sure you know the name. Dancing with the stars. Yeah, of course. He gave me an awesome piece of advice once. He's like, the sooner you learn to not care what other people think about you, like the more happier and the better off you'll be. And, you know, I had my friends that I skied with and like I was having fun and I was just, I just didn't care. In the grand scheme of how people look at you, I look at it like Brian Aragon, who's a famous rollerblader. You have a style that makes... By the way, I, I like the podcast you did with him. Oh, thanks, man. Hey, so he's a, he's a stand up guy, awesome kid. And he had some of the same issues I think you have, but not to the extent you have by any means, but his style is super clean. He makes everything look too easy. It makes it look like he's not even trying, but he lands everything. Some people will say the word robotic, but there's no hard robot moves to anything. He laces every trick. You're the same way. You make everything look easy. Where sometimes you'll look at someone and be like, oh, they have a lazy style. That's pretty cool. Yeah. There is no description to your style. It's just like that guy laces tricks. He lands everything. Uh It doesn't matter how hard it is. Sometimes when you make it look too easy, people can look at it as vanilla or say whatever they want about it. They can't do the tricks. But for you being the pro athlete on a totally another level, for people to be talking shit online about you just about everywhere you look has got to take a toll on your self-esteem because I'm guessing you see that stuff. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I'll admit, I'd scroll the New Schoolers forums and the Facebook comments and everything and see all that. And eventually, like, you know, I just learned to not get too wrapped up in that and, and be like, well, I'm living my dream. I couldn't be doing anything in the world right now that I would rather do, like, I'm traveling the world with my best friends. I've got podiums at these fucking big events and like life ain't bad. <laughs> and so that's sort of what I analyzed it to and, and was like, you know, like I don't care if people are jealous or whatever, but I'm just going to do me. The way I understand that the hate and everything and, and like my style and, and clean tricks and whatever is, is I, I completely agree with you that you know, it's flawless and it's not, it may not be that entertaining to watch. I think you've got to be a bit more of like a skiing purist and really understand the tricks to, to be more appreciative. But I think like guys with more loose styles that maybe do simpler tricks, but do them like way more laid back or with a different flair. I think just to the viewer, you know, it doesn't look perfect, but that is more enjoyable to the viewer because they can relate to it more and they can almost like envision themselves doing these tricks but they're not unfathomable like a double cork 1440 or something you know it's like maybe like a switch to tail press with like somewhat of a backseat landing and they're like oh well like that's sweet i could go out and do that at my local park and so it's more relatable and, and a bit more like enjoyable to watch i think if you and henrik had the exact same run I mean, it's perfect. You're polar opposites in the way you're perceived in the ski world. They're most likely going to score him higher for the reasons that you just said, just because of that flair that he brings to the table. Yeah. And I guess that's not even frustrating because it's something that you've probably had to deal with your whole life and almost everything that you do. In your Olympic foray here, you get third place. A lot of people would be proud of that. And I'm sure you are proud of it now. But when you're on the podium... And you're looking at the two people that were better than you for a kid who likes to be the best and is very competitive. How does that feel? Are you psyched at all? Initially, not, no, not really. That was really hard about, you know, doing the whole like media tour and going home and they had like a parade for me in my hometown and stuff. I mean, all these, all these glory moments were great, but I feel like they were almost unwarranted because I wanted that top spot. And that was like, it was really hard for me, you know all this fanfare and I felt like I didn't really, I I needed to do better. You know, I, I don't know, just being like, just being competitive. I mean, that's just how it is. You know, that's just how I felt, you know, once I had time to reflect and really understand like the scope of things. And of course the, the third ever American podium sweep in history, you know, that was a huge thing that we didn't even realize at the time. Just coming away with an Olympic medal is so 
incredible because there's very few people in the entire world that get to say that. And once I sort of understood the the reality and just what it was, I came to terms and, and became like a lot more stoked on, on uh, sort of the whole Olympic story. But I initially I was like, God damn it. <laughs> Uh, I should I should have like not came off the first rail a bit early and maybe like changed my lineup a little bit and I would have had you know like a ninety five and and beat Joss or whatever. So Olympic gold, I'm sure that's what you're striving for right now. You're on fire right now. What does it take for you to qualify for the Olympics in South Korea? Right now, I'm about halfway there. I've got second at Du Tour and the first American. So I need one more solid result, most likely a podium result at one of the next four qualifiers and I should be in good standing. And of course it's going to take, you know, some stomped dub 12s and switch 14s and, and maybe even some triples. That's what it'll take physically. So, so you should make the Olympic team. You know, if you were a betting man and you had to put money down, you would bet the house on yourself to go to the Olympics, I would think. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. You, so you're going to be on the Olympic team this year. I think that as well. The last Olympics, you're the favorite going in. I mean, I know when you guys got to Sochi, it looked like Joss, you know, he was just on fire. He landed that triple. And I think that opened a lot of people's eyes. But on this one, when you think about the Olympics this year, who is the favorite from the American side? If you had to pick one, you can pull yourself out of this conversation just because... <laughs> It's cool to be the best. You just never want to say it. But who are the people to watch out for? First of all, I think that depends on who you are. I, you, Muhammad Ali really liked to say he was the best. But I would say, you know, that's tough. It's it's more of a wild card year this year because, of course, Joss is coming back from an injury. Does he have a chance? Yeah, I think definitely Joss has a chance. I mean, he was he was riding up here today. He's looking pretty good. and He's just experienced and he's done a bunch of events. So that helps him. But for him, it's all about that knee. Yeah. Been on snow for a month, and he's got four contests to make it happen. Yeah, for sure. And then you have Gus and McRae. Unfortunately, Colby Stevenson got injured at Dutour. Bobby injured himself a little bit. It's weird. Like, it's not quite a changing of the guard yet. I think that'll happen in four more years. But, I mean, if you have these, like, Alex Hall... And Cody LaPlante, you have a couple up and comers that are really hungry and and really good, and definitely pose a threat to knock off the the good old boys from the last Olympics, me, Joss, and Gus. But I I definitely think it'll be a similar team than last time. I think you'll have like the same guys as last time, maybe one different. But I think in like another four years, that'll completely change, and it'll be a bit of a changing of the guard. So I'm going to fast forward to some things that I was going to talk about. You had that date Nick contest. How many times did that get you laid? Oh, wow. Shit. You can say more than five or less than five. No, you know, I don't think that got me laid. It wasn't that itself, but it was the confidence that that gave me. And honestly, like, I've got no shame. That that was a completely shameless self-promotion. I mean, there's nothing more to it, which I just looking back, it's hilarious. But like, that was my idea. And I went to my agent. I was like, hey, like, it's Valentine's Day. We just meddled at the Olympics. Like, why not do some social media circus thing? And, and, <laughs> and we'll see how it goes. And, and uh, after a while, it got really awkward. But I mean, it was it was fun. <laughs> after the Olympics, we'll go back to a negative here. It's the August after the Olympics, you're home. I don't know what's going through your head, but you get in trouble. I think you actually get away. You throw rocks at cars. And then the cops come and you run away because they're not going to catch you. And eventually, against your lawyer's wishes, you tell all the people what you did, pay for their cars and whatever. But what's going through your head then? Because you're like 19 years old. And are you by yourself throwing rocks at cars? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, just when you're when you're in a position where you're hot and you've done something great and you're of interest to the media, you know, if something negative comes out, then they're going to be all over that. And unfortunately that happened you know when that incident happened like my hometown media was like lions on a gazelle they were just like holy shit we gotta cover this and like put it all over that was a culmination of an entire i will say like downward spiral of me just personally and i'll share some personal information with you that i haven't really talked about a lot it's becoming more comfortable and easier to talk about but i dealt with some and just because of just who I am and I don't know, just circ circumstantially, I dealt with some, some pretty bad like mental health issues for a couple of years. 
after the Olympics, had a serious downward spin like two years in a row, particularly in the summertime where I, you know, I was really, really depressed and was asking these like existential questions like, you know, why am I skiing? What am I doing? Like, am I, you know, all my friends are going to college and like getting educated and going on getting real jobs and I'm like traveling the world and playing. That's kind of what it felt like sometimes. And I started to drink a lot and use that as sort of, you know, a way to cover it up and, and started spending a lot more time by myself and, and, um, like drinking by yourself and how much is drinking a lot? Yeah. Yeah drinking by myself and, and just finding excuses to just escape, basically just like escape the, the way that I was feeling. And I was out one night with, with some friends and we were like, I don't know, messing around in the neighborhood and, and they left and I was by myself and thought it'd be a good idea to, I don't know, throw rocks at cars. Cause that's what you do when you're juvenile and, and stupid, I guess. But yeah, but unfortunately, like the media got a hold of that and, you know, it spun all over the internet. And, and that was just a, like I said, just a, sort of a minor part of the whole story. And then the following year, I think it was 2015, I sort of like recovered, had another good season, won the X Games again and like was stoked. And then sort of like the same feelings came back up the next summer. And that's when it got, you know, tenfold worse. And I started to not only just, experiment more with alcohol but start to start to think about like suicide and stuff like that and that's when you know there was a few a couple of really scary instances that shocked some people around me and and I needed to get some professional help so I went to <laughs> my parents were just amazing in this whole process of getting me some help but I uh I went to a rehab center down in Texas right outside Houston for 60 days and uh that's where i sort of had some time to get my shit together and i had i had like no plans of like returning to skiing even i was like i had oh. almost like given up and you know eventually after you know, spending a lot of time and like getting my shit straight and finding myself again and blah 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 you know i finally made my way back to breckenridge went home for christmas this was let's see 2015 2016 came back and was like so fired up i was like the happiest i'd ever been so stoked on life and ever since it's just, it's just been part of me something i've dealt with and something that you know i'm not ashamed to talk about so no you shouldn't be and i mean i look at it as like that coming out about the rock throwing that's probably a good thing for you it embarrasses you it makes you look terrible it brings you back to a, the level that everybody should be at you're no better than anybody else you can't throw rocks at cars it makes you aware of the problem. Yeah, exactly. And then it sounds like it gets worse the next summer. I mean, did you go to rehab for alcohol or was it more rehab for your feelings and your, you just didn't know who you were? You know, a little bit of both. I mean, obviously, like, I had a bad alcohol problem. Like, I, not that I was, like, addicted, but I was more so, like, I just craved the feeling of, like, just fucking escaping my problems. And that's exactly what I, what I used it for. And... I think the 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 program that I did was actually it's called Athletes Recovery and it's it started by this dude who was a uh he played in the NFL and he was an ex NFL player and he got really tired of his friends in the league. He was in the league for like I don't know 8 years or something, but he got really sick of seeing his friends in the league fall victim to like mental health problems and substance abuse and blah blah blah. He had multiple friends just have some serious problems commit suicide, blah, blah, blah. And so we started this program catered towards pro athletes or even like sort of high profile people that are going through similar situations. And that's what I did. And it was a huge eye opening experience. And not only was it like, great to just take some time off from like, just, I don't know, the real world, I guess. It was great to be able to relate to other people who had been through the same thing and who were experiencing the same things that I was. And that was one of the biggest influences of me just like figuring figuring out the recovery. It's an abstract thing to a lot of people. I mean, from the outside, you look and you're like Nick Gepper. He's an Olympian. He's got everything at the tip of his fingers. He should be the happiest person in the world. That's not always the case. And you're lucky that you were able to figure out that you needed help before it was not too late before something really bad happened. Have you ever heard of the Low Pressure Podcast? Yeah, I have. Okay, so 
I am going to let Mark ask you three questions. What's up, Nick? This is Mark Warner with the Low Pressure Podcast, the podcast for skiers, the other one. So being that this is an Olympic year, I figured I'd come up with uh, some Olympic questions for you. Number one, how often have you used or continue to use your Olympic medal to get you laid? Because you know you do it. I would use it every single day if I was single, but I am happily in love. I hope my wife listens. But how about you? <laughs> I definitely use it a few times after the Olympics, but it got old really quick. I was too quickly onto the next thing, like onto the next event, onto the next trick I wanted to learn, onto the next like, you know, travel destination. It was sort of just another, just another, I guess, like award. And I was always like looking forward to, to other stuff. So I'm going to add to his. Your Tinder game must have been on fire. Did that get old too? I don't like Tinder. I don't believe in like meeting people that way, like through like iPhone apps. How about Android? <laughs> Nor that. But I was more of like just, I don't know, I guess meeting people in person and, and just hanging out with my friends and just being like present and not like glued to my phone. So that's that. Okay. He's got two more. Here we go with the next one. Number two. Thinking you're Gus Kenworthy, how often do people ask you how the dogs you saved are doing? Oh, God. <laughs> I got that a lot. Because of that like whole media story that blew up with Gus and the dogs and everything, that was like a part of who I was for like two years. I kid you not. Like People would know that I was Nick Gepper, and they would know that I was not Gus Kenworthy. I was not responsible for the dogs, but I would still get that question all the time. Like, how are the dogs doing? Or like, did you take a dog or blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and Gus is a, a great guy for doing that. But I was like, I don't care. Like, <laughs> I had nothing to do with that. That's the weird thing about the Olympics is it's ironic because the Olympics is all about sports, but it is nothing about sports because... Out of the whole, like, American Olympic slope style sweep, it, it was nothing to do with skiing. It was everything to do with, like, dogs and dates and... Joss got the least press. Yeah, exactly. And it's just, like, a catch-22, but, yeah, it was really frustrating for a while getting those types of questions. Like, you know, you want people to care about your performance and about skiing and about, like, your sport, but they don't. They care about your personal life and puppies and stuff like that. And there is a final question. Number three. It's a follow-up from number two. Thinking you're Gus Kenworthy, how many dudes asked to see your medal? You don't have to answer that question. That is our friend <laughs> from Canada who doesn't have as much common sense as us down here in the States. <laughs> I'll, I'll answer that question. I just want to say, like, I respect Gus, and I think that he's a good role model for people and, and for the gay community, and I just respect him. So that's what I want to say. You don't seem to be one of those guys who is going to ski pow the rest of your life once you're done competing. It hasn't been part of your life growing up, and I don't know if it is part of your life now. Where do you see yourself going after you know the competitive days of skiing are done? I feel strongly about this sport, and I love it. And I hustled really hard when I was younger. I mean, I just like rail jams and, and asking for sponsors and stuff. And, you know, I love seeing that enthusiasm with like young, younger kids now. So I want to give back to the sport in, in one way, shape or form, you know, whether that's an event series or, or like just being present in the industry or something like that. Like I've been given so much from skiing that I feel obligated and passionate about giving back in some way. But after skiing is over, that's a really good question. And I love skiing, but I also, I love competing and I love doing events and I love trying to do better every single time and just leave a legacy of being one of the most dominant competitors. And that's just who I am. And, you know, it's just part of my uh, upbringing. I don't know exactly what kind of legacy I want to leave on the sport just yet, but I want to give back to the sport. You know, who knows? I might want to be involved heavily in the industry and maybe have a job in the industry when I'm done, or I just might be sick of it and want to stay relevant, but have a completely different career and, and lifestyle. But who knows? I mean, I'm really just playing that by ear and, and I haven't gone to school yet. School's always an option. And all I can say is that right now I'm loving what I'm doing and I'm 100% focused on my skiing career. And when that bridge comes, I'll, I'll cross it. So how much is the most uh, skier of your caliber can make in a year? 
ballpark. You don't have to give me your number. On a successful year, you'll make six figures. But on an unsuccessful year, you will make south of six figures. So 101000 or 500000 when you say six figures. Yeah, no, I'm talking like around 100. That's a good year? Just off sponsor retainers, I'm probably making like what you would make at your first job out of college. But that's a whole nother discussion is the financial piece of this. And what the Olympics has done to the sport and, and just the way the sponsors are. But yeah, I mean, I'm incredibly lucky that I am able to live comfortably, make a living. I don't have to have another job. That is part of this whole dream life that I'm living right now. And I couldn't be luckier. So you're in a great place. And I want to say best of luck to you. I hope you win an Olympic gold medal. I say this to everyone who's on the show and don't take offense because you'll hear me say it to someone else later, but hope you win an Olympic gold medal and you are going to be one of the favorites going in there. It is going to be exciting to watch. If you win that medal, you don't have to go to school. You don't have to get a job. You're an Olympic gold medalist. You can do whatever you want. As a bronze medalist, school and a job are probably something that you have to do. Gold medalist, not so much. That couldn't be more untrue, but I appreciate the notion. (laughs) Well, I mean, I look at the Johnny Mosleys of the world and given it all depends on your image and personality, too, because Joss is going to have to work harder to be a Johnny Mosley type figure where Johnny Mosley is just himself and everybody wants him all over the place. If you win an Olympic gold medal or any Olympic medal, you have a really sweet part of you to talk about for the rest of your life that people will pay for. So that's awesome. But I would argue that I never, and I said this in the last podcast, I think, but I never, ever want to go to an event where the speaker is an Olympic silver or bronze medalist. I only want to go to an event with gold. Fuck yeah. If you're there, I'll listen. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, when you're reading about an event that you're going to go to, it's not like I'm like, mom, the Olympic bronze medalist is going to be there. You, yeah, exactly. Exactly. You are 100% right. That's why you got to win gold. That's how it should be. That's just competition, dude. Yep. So hopefully you'll get that medal and we will be able to see you speaking for the rest of your life. I want to thank you for your time and and have a great rest of your day. Hey, thanks a lot, Mike. And uh, I'd love to meet you in person sometime if we're ever in the same spot. So that was time with Nick Gepper, a dude who seems like he's finally figuring out who he is. Things are coming together on snow for Nick as well. It looks like the Olympic dream is in his sights again. And now that he started working on his mental health issues and drinking, it seems like he's more focused than ever. I'm going to predict a silver medal this time around for Nick, and I know he wants gold, but that's my prediction. Next week, I'm stepping back to the show Roots and doing a business episode. I've been focused on athletes lately. My guest is Tim Pogue, and Tim worked for Burton in the late 80s. In the early 90s, he started Ride Snowboards, among other brands, and we are going to talk to Tim about his storied snowboard career. For now, I ask that you review me on whatever platform you listen to me on, share my posts, and tell your friends about the podcast. I also need to thank you for listening and thank my amazing sponsors. They are Evo, Rescue Water, Ten Barrel Brewery, and The Summit at Snoqualmie. Thanks for supporting the show, and have a great week, everyone.